Thank you everybody for coming to this event. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Nguyen Nguyen Din uh, presenting and uh, he will be presenting on green marine hydrogen. Uh, Dr. Nguyen holds a PhD from AIT and has worked for Wood PLC Murray in Ireland with extensive postdoctoral engagement with Trinity College Dublin. He's a senior associate and principal consultant to OWC and is based in Cork, Ireland and uh, he is the marine hydrogen expert on the Mares TA. So on that note, I'll hand it over to Dr Nguyen. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. It's the morning in my time here. First of all, uh, make sure if you can see my full screen. Yes, we can. Very good, yeah. So uh, just to make sure uh, I see uh, my screen from my side. Uh, yeah. So uh, my name is Nguyen Ding. Nguyen is my first name. And um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Asian Development Bank, especially Steve and uh, uh, Dan for organizing this seminar and so for a lot of support and help. Um, and uh, today's topic is about uh, hydrogen, the introduction production from marine renewable and application. So the outline uh, of the presentation is about introduction, uh, how they produce hydrogen in general storage and transportation, and green hydrogen production by water electrolysis, uh, several methods, also the interaction with the power system. Uh, it's uh, one of the re important requirements as well, the add-on for hydrogen and green hydrogen from marine renewable energy uh, and some example about the methanol and ammonia and hydrogen from marine bioresources and application of hydrogen and uh, the strategy or national development roadmap in of hydrogen. Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, the method to produce hydrogen. Yeah, you can see from the left side, from the left side, so uh, if we, I think normally we go from uh, the bottom to top, so they produce hydrogen from fossil fuel is the classical and at the moment is the predominantly uh, from steam methane reforming and from biomass and algae and sunlight renewable from solar wind produced through at water crisis uh, to hydrogen and in terms of storage and transportation hydrogen because it's one of the challenge in hydrogen it is, is and the, all of a lot of the adb members are speaking english as a second language it's tough uh, hi could everybody turn their mics off please sorry uh i just um heard some comment or question from no, was like, some of please proceed dr Nguyen. yeah so i continue my uh talk okay thank you so regarding hydrogen storage and transportation, because of one challenge of hydrogen is that it has low energy per unit volume. That's why we need advanced storage for higher energy density and other challenge like uh, it uh, in uh, easy flammable uh, and uh, ignitable. That's why uh, there are few uh, the, the, here is the comparison of the hydrogen store. For example, uh, if you look at that uh, graph, the vertical axis is energy density and the horizontal axis is hydrogen content per uh, volume. So like at the metro uh, alloy, it can store hydrogen at high density, but the content is very low and the gas is hydrogen is uh, both low in energy density and content. The most um, advanced storage is the chemical hydride or light metal hydride. It can store hydrogen at high content and higher density uh, energy density. And uh, also I, I think you may heard about the uh, metallic uh, 
or credit framework. Uh, it also got store hydrogen at the considerable energy density and hydrogen content as well. And as a method, it's a liquid hydrogen. It can store hydrogen at the highest content possible, but uh, it's medium energy density. Uh, and in terms of application, um, hydrogen have number of application uh, and one of typical uh, method is to use hydrogen for transport or to uh, reproduce electricity uh, through the fuel cell. So in the figure here is a PEM, uh, polymer electron line membrane fuel cell. You see hydrogen is fed in through the anode and uh, uh, through the uh, membranes, there's the catalyst that can split uh, electron and proton uh, from hydrogen, and the pro proton will be migrated to the cathode, and the electron will, uh, uh, will transfer to the cathode through uh, an external circuit, and that create electrical uh, electricity, and at the cathode, uh, the electron will combine again with uh, the proton with the air, uh, the oxygen from the air, and uh, it emit uh, water. So it uh, and so it emit the heat as well. So you see that the revert the revert process of water to acid and the very very clean emission is only water and heat. Yeah, just uh, make sure that there's heat generated from the fuel cell process. And here is the few, there are the three main uh, method for water drysis uh, to produce hydrogen, green hydrogen. We call it green hydrogen, it means that it uh, does not emit uh, any uh, greenhouse gas, especially uh, carbon dioxide. The first one is alkali uh, water analyzer, and the second is the polymer electrolyte membrane or PEM. And the third is the solid oxide. Uh, so you see the different uh, tram operating temperature at three methods as well. So the first method at the moment is a is mature and uh, commercialized already. The second is the at demonstration state, the PM and solid oxide is at the small scale in the lab laboratory state. Uh, let's see what is the characteristic of the uh, water analysis method. Uh, so the requirement of current density uh, for uh, three methods relatively uh, dif quite different. For example, alkali it has a very narrow band of uh, current density requirement. However, PM it allow PM actually oxide it uh, allow uh, they are allow a wider band of uh, current density and so production rate at the moment because uh, alkali is more major, it commercialized, so there is a larger production rate as well. And one important thing that uh, if we uh, if we consider this interaction with the power grid is that the uh, system response in term uh, for alkali and solid oxide that are in term of in the level of second. However, PM is millisecond. It means that the system response from PM to the chain in the current of voltage is uh, for PM is very good. It means it can provide uh, somehow the part of system service. And as well, the cost time for PM is shorter. Uh, so a number of research they mentioned that PM is more suitable for uh, intermittency of the renewable energy such as wind and solar. And uh, here is a further uh, information regarding the relation between actualizer and power system services. For example, for uh, the power system, the fast frequency response and primary operating digital and second uh, operating digital are most important. So they require between uh, from two five seconds. And if you look at the operating condition of the alkali or PM, so the PM can be less than one second. So it means that uh, the utilizer can provide somehow up the op power system service for the power system. We did study uh, well, two years ago 
about the uh, relation between advisor and power system and that the reason of one reason of our study. And uh, in terms of the cost, uh, here is two graph uh, public last year by the OIE Katapun. And you see in the overall uh, to the left is Akala equalizer and to the right are PM equalizer. So you see the cost uh, is continuously reduced and there is a sharp reduction uh, in the next few years before 2025 uh, in Akala. Uh, the reason, one of the reason, is that because of the uh, increase in demand, uh, and you can see there's a break breakdown different um, uh, component of the cost for uh, balance plan, power electronic, and uh, the capital structuring different. So you can see that for the uh, there's a major reason because of the gas conditioning in uh, alkali uh, is the major contribution to the cost reduction. So you see by 2050, uh, the cost for per, uh, uh, the cost per uh, gigawatt, uh, kilowatt, uh, kilowatt is less than 200 uh, British power per kilowatt. So you can see here, yeah. Uh, and in terms of uh, PEM, uh, they also sub reduction now because of the demand and the research development and another sub reduction is coming in next few years and then the cut coming uh, gradually reducing and even it's uh, lower than alkali in by 20, uh, uh, 2030, 30, 40, I would say because uh, there's a forecast in the high demand for PEM uh, compared to uh, alkali, but they more suitable to the intermittency of the power source. Uh, and other aspect is the coupling with renewable energy power plant. Uh, because uh, for water electrolysis, we need electricity, and for a standalone power source, it is the uh, uh, but it's uh, very challenging because it's intermittency of the, the most of the renewable energy source. So uh, there are uh, different uh, scenario of the coupling with renewable energy plant and electrolyzer and the power grid market. The power grid it means the input to the electrolyzer and the market. It means that the output from the electricity uh, market. So. If we go for grid only, if we go for grid only, it means uh, the electricity uh, is not input to, to the electrolyzer. And uh, the couple system uh, and the to the right is hydrogen only, it means the electricity grid uh, or the power plant produce uh, for hydrogen production only. So in different scenarios, the system will go and uh, the recommendation for hydrogen introduction, uh, hydrogen production, and hydrogen plant is to have good uh, system modeling of the hydrogen production and depend on the price of electricity, the requirement of uh, power system, and also the uh, in the future there's the uh, spot or the time varying uh, price of uh, hydrogen. And we can bet select the scenario for hydrogen production. And the uh, here is example of uh, green hydrogen from marine renewable energy. Uh, here is example of the German plan for 700 uh, megawatt of uh, renewables for producing hydrogen. Here is the layout. You can see that uh, the also green. Uh, to the substation and uh, to the electrolyzer produce hydrogen. And hydrogen will be uh, fed into the power plant with the um, uh, the uh, hydro, hydro site through the uh, oil and gas uh, refinery. And also uh, the oil and gas will also uh, use CO2 and hydrogen. Uh, for the industrial process. So the uh, plan is the major consortium from all state EDF uh, and other um, in major institutions also research development. And they now doing a 30 megawatt pilot plan 
uh, for about five years and if the pilot to be successful uh, and they will go into the full scale uh, project. Other uh, project regarding offshore wind to hydrogen in European uh, country, for example, the Copenhagen Airport, uh, Molo Masker is the uh, marine transport. They develop uh, three uh, state hydrogen from offshore wind. The first state is only a pilot 10 megawatt riser and to be operating by 2030. And second state is 200 megawatt. And the third step is really last 1.3 kilowatt and riser and to be operating by 2030 and, to, and power from offshore wind. The second, I think, more well known is that they're not hit to sell dust. And recently, Equino also joined not hit to plan. Uh, that is the uh, plan for three to four kilowatt of offshore wind. But they will start uh, with uh, a demonstration as well. Uh, and the um, the target final target of this plan can be about 10 gigawatt of offshore wind by 2040. Uh, here is the source of the information. If you can go further for detail, and also NG also developed the innovative platform for hydrogen as well. And you look at the not head to plan that we also developing uh, a project in Ireland. We call it the head green that we develop the uh, cost reduction and integration with power grid uh, and uh, one of partner is Equino. So we hope to be interact with that not hate to plan as well. And here is another detailed case study of hypothetical 100 megawatt of wind farm in IHC that uh, I let that uh, development. So we consider a hypothetical uh, of wind farm in the East Coast Island. The reason we select it hypothetical because the, the number of size, so we will not, we did not pick up any specific wind farm, but we assume uh, the extension of one wind farm there because there's a pipeline wind to get ensure cost reduction in the uh, the wind the power power production from wind farm, and it is supposed said that uh, wind power from uh, offshore wind through electrolyzer and the offshore platform. Uh, and store underground and upload through periodical upload tanker. And here's the simulation. You can see that it's very intermittent, very intermittent uh, power input here. Uh, however, there's a matching between hydrogen production and the power input. Uh, just to make sure if you can hear me well. Yes, very much, Dr. Nguyen. We're hearing you very well. We're all, we're all listening intently, so please proceed. Thank you. Yeah, sometimes to check because we are working online. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. OK, so continue my uh, our case study. So that simulation of NPV fireball for two days started. It will have smaller storage means that the tanker have to come uh, in and come out every two days. So we can store about the 35 the requirement of storage 35 ton of hydrogen, but we have better, very good payback period, only uh, more than seven years. And if we increase the uh, storage requirement to be 120 ton or seven days, it means that uh, the tanker, uh, uh, the frequency of the tanker uploading is less uh, in about seven days. So we did have a good uh, uh, Payback period of more than eight years. Uh, however, the assumption is that uh, the hydrogen selling at the uh, production site is a five euro per kilogram, so it's quite high compared to hydrogen from uh, fossil fuel. Or we call blue hydrogen. So, and then we did uh, parametric study study as well. So we see that uh, uh, you see the. Uh, that curve it shows that for a uh, storage less than 30 days, so the the storage term increased slowly. However, if we would like to store more longer than 30 days or one month, so it should quite uh, there's the uh, increase further in storage capacity as well. Uh, and uh, you can see storage and uh, in terms of the e uh, economic parameter. Uh, we compare between discounted payback and simple payback period and recommendation is that we should use discounted payback. Uh, I think that's standard in economics. 
uh, and uh, because of the assumption is hydrogen is quite high, so we recommend stand uh, the input from support from incentive from government uh, through market put and put effect to uh, increase the demand in hydrogen in order to reduce the cost. And other uh, uh, example about hydrogen from wave energy, that uh, we uh, are in uh, South Asia, so wave energy is uh, where energy potential is quite high, considerably high. It's, have, it's the same in Europe. So example is the uh, Finnish wave energy company. Now they start uh, preparing, developing the plan for commercial hydrogen production uh, by combining wave energy device with hydrogen hub. Yeah. So here is a link to the article you can read further. And other uh, example is about the green hydrogen from tidal energy. So at the moment, there is the research uh, and they producing hydrogen from tidal energy yes, by the European Marine Energy Center or the EMEC. And the uh, uh, EMEC can produce hydrogen quite uh, at a uh, considerably last volume at 200 uh, kilogram per day, uh, considerable. Uh, so it's a pilot demonstration stage. And as important uh, hydrogen, it uh, produced through marine bioresource uh, and one of the key uh, shot is the seaweed. It's not through um, it's not through water transit, but it's through the uh, chemical process, thermochemical process. So in the upper uh, figure here, you can see uh, that the glo this is a global distribution of seaweed in green here. And uh, algae is in light green, and compared to the major oil reserve in red. So you see, there's a major oil reserve in uh, northern Europe, in drops here, in uh, Middle East, and somewhere in uh, America. However, compared to the seaweed or algae, it uh, is smaller. So I think this paper is relatively new and was written as well. And in the lower figure, it's a very interesting process. You can see the uh, seaweed is in wet and salty. It, it uh, receives CO2, the carbon dioxide from the, uh, the atmosphere and the sunlight, and through alkali uh, thermal treatment, they call it ATT, uh, and that uh, with the uh, sodium and hydroxide and produce biohydrogen and sodium carb uh, carbonate. And uh, from here we can uh, get hydrogen, and the byproduct is a sodium carbonate. Uh, through uh, another process, uh, it produces the uh, canxi uh, carbonate uh, for inducting yield, and other byproduct is the recycle of sodium uh, hydroxide. And back to that process. So that paper is relatively new and worth reading. Uh, if that the process can be commercialized, so it's one of the typical and uh, popular uh, process for hydrogen production because we it it, it is a uh, circular and the on the byproduct are uh, uh, in uh, post for our uh, potential for wood use uh, as well at the lab scale. Yeah. And uh, other example regarding production and uh, of uh, methanol from a uh, seaweed uh, that conducted by uh, uh, the Marai Center in Ireland uh, uh, and one of my uh, former colleague, Professor uh, Jeremy Fay, leading that process. So they use the uh, ensiling of seaweed, it means the cutting seaweed by a small piece. And that can increase the uh, the uh, methane yield because uh, we need to comp com uh, compensate for the silent fermentation losses as well. So that paper also was treating about how they increase the methane production from uh, bio resources such as a seaweed. Yeah. And another. Um, uh, the right type of hydrogen that is uh, ammonia. Uh, uh, so I will take you through the ammonia tour here. Uh, so look at, at the right uh, you know, flow chart. It's the existing of ammonia through fertilizer refrigeration. 
uh, and explosive and textile pharmaceutical. And future or expanded use of uh, ammonia can be in PEM uh, and other fuel cells, and also can be direct combustion uh, for uh, engine or turbine, also uh, through solid oxide fuel cell. As well, in phase chain of the bunk thermal storage, as well as so, a uh, heat transfer process. So, one advantage of ammonia is that it can produce from electricity uh, to a process they call hyper uh, most uh, process. It's very well established process. And the input are nitrogen from the air, and the main selling are the cost electricity. So, and one another advantage of ammonia is that the uh, production method uh, at higher technology that in the level between five to nine, so it's higher than higher than production. And in terms of market, at moment there's a high market for ammonia, like 176 million ton per year requirement. At at moment, predominantly is from steam revolving of nitro gas to methane, and uh, there's the high uh, contribution of uh, carbon dioxide from ammonia, about two percent of global CO2 emission. So it's considerable to think about how to think how to go for green ammonia, and in terms of storage transport, also it's one of the. Uh, advantage ammonia because it requires uh, chilling only minus 23 degrees Celsius, 23 degrees Celsius compared to hydrogen it uh, very low below uh, requirement below 150 degrees Celsius minus and also storage ammonia is easier and let energy is intensive and cheaper than hydrogen and you look at that graph uh, the dotted one is hydrogen transported by ship, and the um, uh, blue one hydrogen through pipeline. So it increasing pipeline for longer distance. However, for ammonia, you can see it have they have lower cost for ammonia pipeline, and for dotted one, it's very low cost if we transport ammonia by ship. Yeah, so it's something we consider is the number of advantages to ammonia. If we can produce hydrogen and nitrogen, uh, and so uh, the Sebastian process to be ammonia. And uh, next uh, topic about application of uh, for of hydrogen for marine businesses. Uh, here Kawasaki already uh, uh, built the tanker, small tanker or large tanker for hydrogen transportation. At the moment. Is uh, the blue or brown hydrogen from Australia uh, to uh, Japan for high demand in future? But uh, there is no reason. Uh, uh, there are always reasons that they can. The good reason they can transport green hydrogen as well in the future. And uh, uh, recently, our uh, company Aculit Pema LOC also joined hydrogen power ferry project. That is the third project, uh, Yacon High Seas to number three, to be uh, for two state uh, for hydrogen fuel cell and hybrid ferry. And uh, the uh, Aqualit Perma LC will be designing a double ended sea going passenger and car ferry that capable of uh, using hydrogen power and uh, drive train as well. Uh, it can be uh, completely emission free. So uh, not only hydrogen production, but hydrogen application, research and development demonstration now is going uh, well. So that is the uh, one of the reasons for reduce the cost of hydrogen and increase the demand of hydrogen. And uh, if we look a uh, bigger view uh, for hydrogen uh, or the um, uh, maritime transport. So here is the uh, this the summary of the International Maritime Organization IMO. That is the uh, emission from maritime transport a number of uh, uh, non-clean uh, emission like SOX, NOX, and uh, particle matter. So it it uh, is the concentrated in some area like in European Sea or. Uh, and not a medical sea. So there are requirements so for reduced emission from maritime transport. That's why 
is potent so it will pyrogen ammonia in the maritime transport as well. So recently we did uh, a study for using fuel cell uh, into the obsolete support first. So, so that's the one reason that obsolete support first. So the, the requirement of distance is the only short distance and uh, it requires uh, also the high speed and green to be operated in the sea because offshore wind is a green renewable energy. That's why we uh, preliminarily designed the offshore wind so using hydrogen tank and uh, fuel chain, the fuel cell as well. And uh, the next uh, topic is about uh, national green hydrogen strategy based on marine resource. But uh, as we know that hydrogen is relatively new and uh, we have huge resource, but how to develop hydrogen, the hydrogen demand, hydrogen production and consumption is very effective way in order to reduce cost and increase the effectiveness as well. So one way to develop the good roadmap. And one example is the Arid Option Green Hydrogen Roadmap that uh, I was co-leading. So in that roadmap, for example, by 2030 that we developed uh, hops of wind for about six gigawatt for electricity, but we start uh, develop hydrogen at small scale between two to one gig, uh, uh, two hundred to one gig at uh, a hydrogen uh, small scale for heat and transport application. But we uh, propose to increase the scale of hydrogen production between three to six gigawatt by twenty forty. Uh, it's about 30% of the absorbing installation compared to about 8 kilowatt of uh, absorbing for it uh, for electricity production. And by 2050, so you see between uh, 9 to about 16 kilowatt of, of absorbing for production compared to only 9 kilowatt of uh, absorbing for electricity. So about 60% of absorbing can be for hydrogen production. So uh, that is the roadmap that different states that we can deploy observing not uh, only for electricity but for hydrogen production for export market and other market like a heat and transport as well. And the other potential application is that hydrogen could be uh, produced electricity and feed back to the power uh, powers system. However, at the moment, the efficiency is uh, relatively low, so we consider it to be a bit far future application. And as a very typical uh, roadmap is OK, uh, the UK absorbing hydrogen strategy. Uh, so the energy system in the UK at the moment, they uh, propose to be to have about 75 gigawatt of absorbing for electricity. However, uh, the roadmap mentions that it, they can develop further 75 gigawatt of oxygen for hydrogen production. It means that they can better integrate the other 75 gigawatt of oxygen for electricity uh, through the process. What I mentioned is about the contribution to grid system service. Also, they uh, estimate that uh, by 20, 35, 30, 37, the prior of hydrogen, you can see the, the, the black curve here, is the uh, prior of blue hydrogen through the steam methane deforming and CO2, the carbon capture here. It can increase. However, the the uh, the white uh, light, white with the white curve here is the prior of uh, green hydrogen through PM. So it's reduced, it's reduced from 2030 or from the from the current price down to about 1.65 uh, uh, British power per kilogram. So it, it left it lower than uh, blue hydrogen about 2038. Uh, uh, and a little bit about our group, uh, uh, just to introduce uh, who we are. So we are uh, an energy and marine consultant and we uh, work through different uh, service uh, from project development from RICS and uh, other service through uh, the uh, several uh, company like old WC option consultant that I'm uh, the senior associate 
and we have also a geotechnical company. Inoci is the IND company. They are doing detailed design uh, and consultancy uh, and uh, for also green, uh, renewable and floating PV as well. And they have long details that say support for EPCI. So our company, we have uh, the outfit, uh, city outfit in 38 uh, countries on at about 300 locations and total of number of employees more nearly um, 900 people. So uh, thank you for the time and attention. Uh, so any question, uh, please. So I hand over to the chair, uh, Stephen, yeah, please. Yeah, Dr. Nguyen, thank you very much. Um, We've got about 30 people on the, the call, uh, uh, most of whom are right in the middle of this particular activity. So I'm expecting we will have some questions. Um, I'm going to ask Toro Ito if he would like to ask the first one after this. Uh, but um, I was interested just on your slide 17, um, you talked about sodium carbonate and industrial calcium carbonate and using sodium hydroxide. Um, do you do you have any pilot? Is there any pilot locations on that that you've got? That's actually being where that's being done, and if there are, is there any net carbon sequestration component to that? Are we pulling carbon out of the atmosphere or out of the sea by doing that? So, uh, do you mean that slide number ten here? No, seventeen. One seven. Ah, oh, oh, sorry, one seven. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, at the moment. Um, that slide is the is the only uh, my knowledge we haven't uh, had uh, practical experience uh, within my research group, but we have the experience through other research groups through our Marais Center. Okay, because yeah. one of the things we're trying to look at Marais is not just production of energy and hydrogen, but looking at the capacity to sequester carbon off the back of it by through biological processes. So this is this is something I didn't know about until this call. So. I will thank you for that. So on that note, I'm going to open up the floor for questions or comments or anybody would like to put something in. Please raise your hand and I'll recognise you. Wow, everyone's a bit shy. Yeah, right. so we yeah, we can continue to talk about that uh, slide. Actually, I I read, uh, I read very carefully and it's very interesting, very potential. So the only thing that we need to commercialize or develop at larger scale. Yeah. So that's something we can look further with besides some uh, very popular process through water hydrolysis. Yeah. OK, so Toro Itu, who's a colleague, um, uh, is the hydrogen expert in our group. Um, it's a gas expert, actually. He's a, he's a proper gas guy. Um, uh, asked about the potential for floating solar and hydrogen, and there is a there's an add-on to that question that uh, oceans of energy have just completed a year and a half trial in the North Sea with floating solar, and it's still there. It hadn't got washed away with all the storms. Have you looked at floating solar in your activities? I know you're a wind guy, Dr. Nguyen, but have you looked at floating solar as well? Uh, thank you. Uh, good question from the colleagues. So floating solar, uh, especially in the North Sea, with the uh, integration with uh, aquaculture uh, and in uh, Mediterranean and somehow in South Asia. It, uh, so regarding the hydrogen production from FPV, uh, the I would say I could talk through the advantage and disadvantage. The advantage is that uh, the cost relatively uh, low compared to absorbed wind. And uh, there's a good uh, platform for hydrogen production through the com uh, combination with the uh, floating PV platform. However, there's a, I would say it's a challenge rather than advantage is that hydrogen still have to produce onshore, uh, if not that offshore. So, and then in terms of the small scale, uh, because uh, we have very low capacity factor for, uh, for solar, solar PV is only less than 20%, uh, capacity factor or only like a seven to eight hour per day. So it, it says some challenge in terms of cost as well. Yeah. So it still need uh, grid integration if we, we want to produce a large scale hydrogen. So I could say the potential of floating PV hydrogen uh, production is that if there is the um, in the future if there is the hydro water hydrolyzer 
uh, using uh, direct, directly that directly use uh, salty water or sea water so that the high potential otherwise it is with water supply as well. Okay, great point. Um, Nick, would you like to ask a question? You want to turn your camera on and turn your mic on? Thanks. I won't put the camera on, Steve. I've, I've got a bit of connectivity problems this morning. Dr. Ian Goyen, thank, thank you for uh, that. Was really fascinating. I've learned a huge amount this morning. Um, I've, I've got several questions, but uh, one of them is probably a bit naive, and that is you, you showed the example of the uh, the two ended, the double ended ferry um, that's being developed and the operation of it. Can you just, are you able to talk a little bit about how reliable propulsion systems are with using uh, hydrogen? Are they? Um, less reliable than uh, uh, oil uh, carbonaceous systems or more reliable? And, and are there any other? Uh, clearly, they put out water rather than emissions. But is there, um, is there a, uh, a business model benefit? Is there a USP in there that results from using a hydrogen propulsion plant rather than a carbonaceous fuel that can be articulated? Uh, thank you. Uh, interesting question. So uh, did you mean about that slide and the... Uh, yeah, that's the one. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. So is it, is, it, so, uh, is it cheaper to maintain, cheaper to operate, uh, better all round, or are there some pros and cons there? Yeah, so let we talk to different state, uh, uh, different state of that um, uh, ferry. So in terms of the uh, energy input, so compared to the uh, normal uh, fossil fuel uh, ferry, or the electric ferry, so that the AMRT it's a hybrid ferry, is the uh, using the right of hydrogen, uh, and the uh, a, a the electricity. So the power up the in terms of the input, uh, of course, the hydrogen is more expensive, uh, and so the um, equipment, the uh, engine, is more expensive. However, that the for the decarbonization of the marine transport as well, yeah. Uh, and in terms of operation, that's what I heard from my colleagues they working on that uh, ferry design. So in terms of uh, maintenance, uh, the hydrogen uh, engine or the hybrid engine is uh, less uh, labor intensive compared to the uh, the, um, uh, the the common ferry uh, using either uh, diesel or um, the uh, nat the uh, natural gas fire. So, and in terms of emissions, so that until an other advantage of hydrogen or hybrid ferry. Uh, so at the moment, the ferry is at the design and demonstration stage. So uh, it needs a, a, a lot of um, uh, scaling up and optimization as well. And as the aim of that hydrogen uh, ferry is that they can expand to other applications to what I mentioned in the uh, observing crew transfer virtual and other is a dynamic positioning virtual as well. Uh, uh, did I answer my uh, Zoe question? Yeah, you did. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. I won't. I've got loads of questions, but I won't ask any more because there's other people in the queue. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you can. Uh, I mean, if you would like to know more, you can send me maybe a message, and then I can forward to the uh, group who actually uh, doing that uh, design as well. Sure, thank Nick, you very much. Nick, we'll get much. you to yeah. come back after the other two guys have asked their questions. Jin Mao, mate, please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, in your in the 10 slides, uh, you, uh, you, in, you introduced the uh, two system, compound system and only hydrogen system. So uh, from the perspective, the number 10, yeah, I'm going back to that. Sorry, Azar. Yeah. Yeah, he has you. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, uh, from the perspective of investor, we will comp we will compare the investment cost of these two systems with the cost of the hydrogen produced from the solar uh, system. So, I'm worrying about that the two system are not competitive. So, do you have uh, any comments on this? So, are you as you mentioning about solar instead of absorbing? Yes, for the yeah. last 
Very good. Yeah. So is it um, floating or like offshore solar or onshore solar? Uh, is uh, an, an end, not a floating. Yeah, yeah because the, the reason I ask because there are different characteristics of the uh, connection to the power grid compared to onshore offshore system. So mm -hmm. for solar, I would say um, the cord is more advanced compared to um, offshore wind. So I think you for onshore we need. Uh, to consider the uh, the cost of water supply as well. Sorry, I'm. Uh, uh, we need to consider the cost of water supply. Water supply. Yeah, water supply. Yeah. So because water is not free, so we need to consider the water. Uh, because the if the existing system they can use only the fresh water. Mm. Uh, however, in the future, the electrolyzer that can directly use uh, sea water, so there's high potential application for water and rises. And the other cost you, we you need to consider is that because of the low capacity of solar, so we need to consider the cost of grid system service or the power grid. For example, in the evening, if you would like to produce hydrogen, so you need to import. Uh, electricity from the grid, so it's something you need to consider. However, hopefully in the evening, the electricity price from the grid is lower than in the daytime, but we need to put in this system model. Yes, uh, if if we consider uh, if if we consider uh, use the sea water, so the the competition points are based on the offshore wind wind system and uh, Panasonic system. So it's uh, at this moment, it's difficult to say the, off the offshore wind combined system can be win. Yeah, so I think um, because at the moment, the, uh, the, the electrolyzer using uh, water, sea water is the, at the R&D process demonstration. So, we can use the stress water. We can think about using uh, using fat water for demonstration at smaller scale. But in the future, if we produce hydrogen at very large scale, like a multi gigawatt system, so mm -hmm. we may need to think about to critically think about the water supply. So sea water one is more potential, and because of the uh, the uh, you know. Uh, because of the increasing in the water level, uh, sea water level. So if we use the water, uh, sea water for uh, hydrogen production, so one of the counter balance wet method for uh, the uh, sea level rising as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thanks, Jin Mao. Uh, we might have to drag you into doing some work on Mares after that question. Um, uh, just one point to make. Uh, we in the Mares TO are actually having a look further at some emerging technology which will use um, uh, desalination but change the desalination mix so that we actually create calcium carbonate so we're looking at sequestering carbon as well that's something else we're having a look at after we've got uh, Dr Nguyen uh, well entrenched in the team so next question is from my friend Keshen Samara Singh Keshen the floor is yours thank you thank you Stu uh, thank you for the you better speak up, mate. We can't hear you. We can't. You have to speak up. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Yes. Yeah. Better. Thank Actually, you. Actually, uh, I just want to know: Do we can find a electrolysis unit like from the market, uh, which we can be used to generate uh, both hydrogen and electricity uh, through reverse mode, like si uh, similar to a hy uh, hybrid solar inverter? So uh, I know about the uh, uh, solid oxide electrolysis cell. Uh, which is uh, able to operate in reverse mode, uh, but it is a pre-commercialized technology. So uh, I saw in your presentation the operating uh, responding time of uh, SO uh, EC is high. So uh, why I am mentioning that? Currently, I'm working uh, on a project with utility companies, so, and they are looking uh, commercially available such technology to pilot. So uh, grateful if you could let us know about such technology a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Uh, this is uh, a question on the other aspect of the area uh, regarding heroism application and production. Yeah, it's important to consider the power grid aspect. Yeah, that's what I mentioned. So regarding if I move back to that, uh, yeah, so I think so. If we go that may be better. So solid oxide actually at the uh, pre commercial I think at the R&D and these states. And in terms of that reversed or dual mode of hydrogen uh, production and uh, electricity production, uh, what I heard so far is in Germany from one of my, uh, uh, I attend a seminar and there's one research as I mentioned at the uh, uh, research institution they seen testing a dual mode of uh, Electrolyzer that can produce hydrogen and store hydrogen and produce electricity back to the grid. And the the nominal capacity is about 15 uh, kilowatts. So it's relatively small, not less than one megawatt. Yeah. However, I think that's one aspect of your, the answer to your question. But the other aspect of uh, the answer to your question is that even using hydrogen. Uh, actualize the only single mode to, to produce hydrogen only that it can produce the power system uh, service service to power system because it uh, you know uh, in the power system when it dispatched out the electricity when the load is uh, reduced so we need to dispatch uh, out electricity so instead of dispatch out the the uh, power actualizer plant can use the uh, electricity to build hydrogen and the system respond here, what I mentioned here. If, if we use a PM, so this power plant system can react very quickly to this spread down and to use that um, electricity to build hydrogen within a, a millisecond level. So it means that we can actively or effectively use uh, electricity that are going to be dispatched from the system. That's a, so that's a two aspect of the answer to your question. Uh, maybe did I answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks, Keshan. Um, Dr. Nguyen, I better re uh, going to go back to Nick Lambert, but I should tell you who he is. He's Rear Admiral Nick Lambert, retired Royal Navy, who's the marine economy expert on the TA. So he's our uh, TA. So he's very interested to hear what you have to say. Nick, the floor is yours, mate. Thank you very Welcome. much indeed. Uh, it could, uh, this may be an unkind question, but could you could you talk a little bit about the um, the TRL level, the technology readiness level that the that the technology is generally at? I was really impressed to see the examples that you gave. I, I uh, the end to end examples you gave. Um, I knew about the Orkneys one. Um, I didn't know about the German one, uh, which looks very sophisticated. Um, what what are where, where do you see this technology in relation to uh, the the climate change crisis that we've got? What are the blockers? How do we make this move into uh, routine commercial practice rapidly? How do we get the business model to work? Is it a, a question of uh, the distribution network for hydrogen? Is it converting end users to uh, hydrogen? Uh, combustion systems, or is it is it a cultural problem, or is it a political problem? What, or is it, I, I suspect it's a blend of all of those. And is it just simply the fact that fossil fuels are cheaper and better? Um, how, how do we how do we get hold of this and make it move quickly? Uh, thank you for a very um, high level and important question. Uh, I think maybe. Um, uh, some uh, a minister or prime minister maybe answer that better than me, uh, but I try. Uh, I, so I think I'll believe you more than most prime ministers or ministers, I can go in. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So can we go uh, step by step? So in terms of the technology that in it, um, for hydrogen at the moment, as I mentioned here, and can lie is the technology that the TIL is high, so it can be eight or nine at the commercial stage. PM a little bit lower, about 10 megawatt scale. Uh, so now it's commercial, but sm smaller scale. And solid oxide is in uh, need moderation. 
So uh, how I've applied as what I mentioned it the last application. I mean it the uh, last response to system. However, it's still good if we use hydrogen production uh, standalone system as well. And it's still continue to improve Akalai uh, in terms of the system response to reduce uh, that uh, time that react to the change in the uh, input uh, of the electricity. So the uh, other uh, answer to the question, how can we increase the improves the technology that it so there are uh, different uh, uh, factors that influence on that improvement the first is the demand so so far because of, uh, the demand in green hydrogen is less because the blue hydrogen from uh, methane reforming uh, it's cheap and uh, however for now so uh, depend on the uh, the, the level of technology development in every country. So, for example, in European, they already uh, they already uh, public the European hydrogen strategy. Uh, for example, in Germany, they will import hydrogen, and other countries like Belgium, uh, they also will majorly import hydrogen. And other country like Ireland, we think about producing hydrogen at larger scale. So that's why the that number of multi megawatt factory plan already now being developed. So that's the way we increase the demand in hydrogen, uh, uh, hydrogen use. Uh, and the second is that uh, we, uh, the research and development, uh, so far we need to put more on uh, research development uh, in different states. For example, uh, the uh, utilizer, the Kato, uh, and I, I know and catalysts the catalyst catalyze the uh, chemical agents that can have to speed up the uh, chemical reaction as well uh, in the fuel cell in the reverse uh, system and in the national level that's uh, something we uh, may uh, national level or government level uh, we need to think about um, the energy security issue, because like in next, I would say 20, according to the British Petroleum uh, Statistics, so they uh, mentioned that by 2016, they said, they mentioned that only 50 years time uh, for uh, proof oil reserve and proof, proof natural gas reserve, reserve. So no matter how we are or where we are, we have only about 50 years of uh, natural gas and oil. So that means that we need to put more uh, investment and effort on green hydrogen production, not only because of climate change, but also energy security issue. Yeah. And the other aspect yeah, is that um, uh, what I mentioned is about sector coupling. So far, the energy sector consists of several sectors, for example, electricity, transport, uh, heat in the Europe, or cooling in the uh, uh, the tropical country and in Indian. So they use energy separately. However, there is a challenge if we in introduce further uh, renewable energy, it's intermittency, so it's issue of uh, grid surface or uh, the uh, inertia. So that's the uh, we need to put more on the sector coupling. How to think if we there's a power plant it can use for electricity but can use hydro production and how to mobilize on the inertia or uh, system stability method not only for electricity but for the other grid service. So that's some recommendation from me if we want would like to make your yeah, hydrogen uh, more cheaper and uh, if for it in parallel we increase the TIO. Uh, did I answer the question? You did. I thought it was a great answer. We're going to run you for prime minister in going. I thought that was excellent. Yeah, outstanding. I totally agree, Nick. Yeah, well done, Dr. Dr. Um, does anyone have one last question? Okay, sorry. Okay, so Nick, do you want to have one last question or you we, we close up? Well, I, I'm I'm also interested in whether you've looked at or if you know of any studies that have looked at the relative costs of transporting uh, hydrogen in relation to fossil fuels. 
Um, so if we're, we're moving oil all around the world, if we want to start moving hydrogen around the world, how do we how do we drive the cost of that down? Have there been any studies done into that? Or is it going to be one of those where the costs just are going to ramp up at the beginning and you just have to suck them up until um, over time they reduce? I think Toro Ito has done some work on that in the hydrogen handbook, but I can't confirm that. Um, I'm not sure if Toro is still on the call. Toro, do you have an answer to that? Uh, hello, Steve. I'm here. Yeah. Uh, trans yeah. Transportation of hydrogen. It depends on the distance. If it's longer distance, uh, maybe uh, ammonia will be the uh, best option. Best option. Uh, I think Bloomberg uh, issued some uh, report, a uh, very good report on that issue. And if uh, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, yeah, pipeline transport is of course uh, uh, attractive. Uh, uh, especially if we have the existing gas pipeline, we can utilize about that uh, by the uh, mixing uh, in the natural gas. So yeah, it depends on the application. Did I answer? Okay. <laughs> no, no, Toro, that's terrific. It's, it's, it's um, uh, what's the name? We need to have you more involved in this TA now that Dr. Nguyen's on. But we, we now have people who can speak your language, so that's good. Um, the technical language, that is. Um, okay, so um, we've come to the end of time. Uh, Dr. Nguyen, I really wanted to uh, say how much we appreciated this presentation. It was first class, uh, and there was a lot of things I learned, and I, a number of our team members have learned a lot as well. We look forward to having you involved in the Mara's TA and uh, hopefully we can figure out a way to make hydrogen more accessible to remote communities and also sequester some carbon in the act in the in the process. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see you at the next brown bag, which will probably be in about three weeks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve, for uh, sharing section. Uh, look forward to seeing you later. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Good weekend, too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.